Judges chapter 6. Judges chapter 6. If, if your mom, your dad, or let's say your grandparents were not Bible-believing Christians, then there's a, there's, a, there's a story here for you. Okay? Now, my great-grandmother, Hoggard, was a godly woman. Uh, Lorinda Hoggard was her name. She, she knew... That God, she'd always told her family that God told her that she was going to live to be a hundred years. And she lived to be a hundred and one. And she just knew the Lord. She knew, she knew God. And um, my Mima knew the Lord. She loved the Lord. My mom's mom. First the first prophecy conference, Bible conference I ever preached was at 47th Street Baptist Church in North Le it's Levy, Arkansas, where my grandmother was a member. She helped get me in down there with the pastor. And that, my goodness, that was, I want to say that was 1999, maybe. So that was a long time ago. And yeah, it was a long time ago. And uh, my mother, of course, is responsible for me and my sis coming to church here. And, um, but there are a lot of people whose mom and dad, maybe their mom or their dad or their grandparents or whatever, but they were not Bible believers. And maybe they taught you a different religion. Maybe they taught you that to not believe in God, you don't need God, God is a crutch, God is an excuse, I've heard. I uh, used to work with a guy, he was all Mr. Independent, didn't believe in God, didn't like my religion. His dad, he said, my dad taught me there are no miracles, there's only discipline. And I used to just shake my head. And I thought, you know... Self-discipline, I believe in discipline, I believe in self-discipline. But that only lasts you so long. And then when your body can't do what you want it to do anymore. Of course, he had a marriage and he ruined it because he went out and made a kid with some other gal that wasn't his wife. So he didn't have much self-discipline there. Maybe he needed a miracle. But some parents just didn't teach their children right. And that's Gideon. And God is making Gideon decide who he's gonna, whose side he's going to be on. Now, I'm one of these, family is important to me. Family means a lot to me. And I've got aunts and uncles and cousins and and when we'd go down to visit them, and that was a big thing. And I love them dearly. But I can't help being who I am just because my relatives are not that way. And I love them. But that doesn't mean that I'm going to be with them when it comes to deciding, do I love God or not? And if you'll think about this, your lost family members, many of them will stop at nothing to try to pull you out of God's house. They'll stop at nothing. And they'll schedule every kind of family get together Sunday at 12 o'clock. Just so you can't, they'll do it on purpose. Just so you can't be at church. 
And I know sometimes family calls and this, and that, and the other, but at some point you decide God is first. My home is second. And everybody else, if they want me, I'll be in church Sunday. Did I make you mad? Judges chapter 6, verse 25. You believe the Bible? Amen. That's good. It came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, Take thy father's young bullock, even the second bullock of seven years, and throw down the altar of Baal that thy father hath. Look at what he's telling him to do. Take his dad's bullock and go and destroy his father's altar to Baal. And then he said, cut down the grove that is by it. Now, let me explain that grove. That's not just a garden or, or some shrubbery that he's got in front of the house. Always, and you see this now. You can tell pretty much in this town who's Catholic. Just drive down and look at their front yard. Because out where they got their flowers and their bushes, they've got a little statue of Mary surrounded by bushes, surrounded by shrubbery, surrounded by flowers. That practice is all the way back to fertility goddess worship. And they had a goddess in the Bible named Ashtaroth. She's called Diana in the book of Acts. She is mystery, Babylon the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. She's a fertility goddess. And all the time in old times, they would worship her by putting a statue of her in and amongst some shrubs and some flowers and some plants and whatever it was. And they worshiped her as the goddess of the earth. The goddess of fertility. And some of their rites were just downright evil. Some of the practices that they did. Some of those practices are still done in different areas around the world. And they're disgusting. No, I'm not going to tell you what they are. They're, they're wicked. They're just lascivious. That's what they are. So God told... God told, here's the angel of the Lord, God telling him, throw, take, the, take the bullock, throw down the altar of Baal that thy father hath, which probably had a statue of Baal, or maybe a golden calf or a calf of some kind, and then cut down the grove that is by it, meaning, cut down all the shrubs and the flowers and the plants and destroy that fertility goddess idol. Tear it up. In verse 26, he said, Build an altar unto the Lord thy God upon the top of this rock. Think about that phrase. This rock. In fact, you'd underline that, write that down somewhere, and then go study that. Where, if I were to say, can you give me a verse in the Bible where it says, This rock. A verse in the Bible. That's pretty good. He built his house upon a rock. Jesus said, upon... Now, now it comes to mind, doesn't it? Upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Let me tell you something. When it comes to your daddy's religion or your mama's religion, if it's not Bible-believing Christianity... And what we believe, you have nothing to worry about when it comes to them versus us. And it will, listen to me, it will come down to them versus us. What did Jesus tell us about our mothers and our fathers and our brothers and our sisters that are not following Jesus? You're not worthy to be the disciple of Christ if you love them more than you love Jesus. And this Bible, see, you don't see on the back of my car a sticker that says coexist. And let me tell you something, that is a fantasy. 
that people believe that all the religions of the world are going to get along. Listen, they all hate each other. But when it comes, and you know what I'm going to say? I'm going to, I'm going to be whatever liberals hate. I'm going to be that today because I'm going to say our religion is right. Amen. And if I didn't believe it, then I have no business being in this pulpit with this Bible preaching it to God's people who believe it. And let me tell you, there's nothing wrong with believing that the way of the cross and the way of Jesus Christ and the way of the Word of God is the only way that there is. And I'm not apologizing for that. You realize at some point, let's say, let's say the Lord's coming is, I don't know, within the next 10 years. I don't know that. But let's just say it is. So what that means is in the next 10 years, there's going to be a showdown. Just like with the prophets of Baal and Elijah. There's a showdown. And everybody is going to have to pick a side to be on. Now, what I want to be is a light to people saying, come over and follow Christ because we're going to win this thing. But there's going to be people who are not and there's going to be people in my family that are not. And there's going to be people in your family that are not. And the Bible says that they are going to hate you. They're not going to love you. They're not going to be your friend. They're not going to be nice to you. They, according to the scriptures, will think to kill you and think that they're doing God a favor. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. The Bible says there's going to be a strong delusion and it's going to take over their mind. And they are going to hate you. So, when it comes to Family, friends, neighbors, people that you work with, love them, never hate them, never talk down to them, try to win them, but understand that when it all shakes loose one of these days, they are going to be your bitter enemy. And they will want to have you killed. That's what the Bible says. Cut down the grove that is by it. Build an altar unto the Lord thy God upon the top of this rock. In the ordered place. And take the second bullock and offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the grove which thou shalt cut down. You look at what God is telling Gideon to do. Take that wood, that, 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 that little grove that your mom and daddy put together where they had that fertility goddess. I want you to cut all that down and I want you to take that very wood and I want you to use it to offer that your daddy's bullock as a burnt offering to who? Who are we offering it to? Offering it to God. Jehovah God, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. That's what God said. He said, tear down your daddy's altar, tear down your daddy's idol. Tear down that grove, take that wood, sacrifice that bull. And he said, what I'm doing, Gideon, you're going to have to decide, are you going to follow me or are you going to stick with your daddy? Your daddy's wrong. So, verse 27, Then Gideon took ten men of his servants and did as the Lord had said unto him. And so it was, because he feared his father's household and the men of the city, that he could not do it by day, that he did it by night. Now, remember who Gideon is. Gideon is you. And let's be honest, you're not all that bold either. And if you were doing this, you would want to follow God, but you wouldn't necessarily want your dad standing there watching you do it. So God did allow him a little grace. If you want to do it by night, go ahead. It's just that eventually they're going to wake up and they're going to see this thing and you're not going to be on their happy list. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father.
help us. Lord, I love my family. I love, I love my daughters. I love my sons. I love my grandchildren. I love my mom, my sis. I love all their family. I love all my cousins, aunts, uncles. I love them all. But Father, I know some of them are not right. And Lord, some of them are diametrically opposed to everything I believe, everything I preach, everything I teach, things I've made videos on. I know that they are diametrically opposed to it. And God, you know me. Know me well enough to know that I want to make people happy. I want them to like me. And I thank you, God, for removing me far enough away from most of my extended family so that I don't worry about what they think when you ask me or tell me to do something, when you ask me to make a video or preach a message. God, I'm not sitting here worried about what they think. So in a way, I'm like Gideon. I'll do what you say, but I really don't want to do it with them standing there watching me. And Father, there's probably a lot of people sitting here today or listening online that are a lot like Gideon. They love their family, go to family reunions, family get-togethers. But when it comes to serving you, Father, we have to decide that we have to separate ourselves. And we can't be like they are. We can't do what they do. And we can't turn our backs on you. We can't turn our backs on church day. We can't turn our backs on the things, God, that you've called us to do. Simply because our families want us to go do something with them or be part of what they're part of. Or when they're going to get together and they're going to drink, God, we can't, we can't be part of that. When it comes to their religious services, they'll want us to come for so-and-so's baptism. Or they'll want us to come for such and such religious deal. And God, we can't do that. We can't be part of that. And Father, you, while you've called us to honor our father and our mother, and yet, Lord, you told us that if we love them more than we love you, then we're not worthy to be your disciple. So, Father, I understand, God, how it is when we are put to choices on whose side we're going to be on. We love our family and we want to honor them. We don't want them mad at us. But yet, God, when we think about it, there is nothing, and I mean nothing in this world, that is worth losing what you have given us at Calvary for. Nothing. Nothing. And Father, I pray, dear God, that you would help us to be Gideon. And Lord, you'll always give us grace and help us do it. But at some point, we have to not be part of what other people want us to be. So God, strengthen us and God, help us, Lord. Thank you, dear God, that there's somebody in the Bible that's like us. A little bit scared. But we know what you've called us to do. So Father, bless us and help us, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Take your Bible, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, if you would. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. This is not in my notes, and I'm kind of glad for that, because I've been asking God to help me preach the message, and some things I have in my notes are not really where God's taking this thing. But 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and while you're turning there, I, I just want to say... I want to reach out to the young people. 
Those of you online, those of you sitting here, I want you to listen to, I want you to, listen to preacher for a minute, okay? When I, when, I was, when I was in school, I got saved when I was nine and was baptized here in this baptistry. And my mama made sure that we were in church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. We were at revival services. We were at quarterly meetings. We were just, if anything was going on at church, we were there. That's just how it was. And my mom taught us that when it came to church or it came to, let's say, playing ball, church came first. Didn't matter what night they scheduled the ball game or what night they scheduled practice. Church came first. And that's just the way that, that our mom raised us. And now that I'm older, she was right. Because when I look back, I'm not an athlete anymore. Quit laughing. I'm not playing in a band somewhere or an orchestra. I'm preaching a church service. My mama knew what eventually was going to mean the most to me years down the road. And that was being in the house of God and doing what God said rather than what everybody else said. Now, I don't have a problem with playing ball or, go, you know, being part of the band or doing this an extra thing at school. I don't have a problem in the world with that. But at some point, you've got to decide, am I going to follow the world or am I going to follow what God said? And then when I, when I was in high school, I just decided, God helped me with it. I decided that I didn't mind it if people knew. And I'm talking, when I say people, I mean the teachers and the students. I decided that I did not mind that they knew that I was a Christian, that I went to church, that I helped out, at, even when I was a teenager, I was leading the music here in this church. I didn't mind if people, at, if my buddies at school found out about that. When I announced the call to preach when I was 16, I decided that at school I didn't mind if they found out about it. I didn't mind if my friends knew that when I graduated High school, I was going to Bible college. I didn't mind, and if they were my friends, they didn't mind it. And if they weren't my friends, then they weren't my friends. If that, if finding that out said to them, well, I don't like him, I don't want to hang around him, then they weren't my friends. And let me tell you something else. There was about five guys that I hung with on a regular basis in high school. None of them have anything to do with my life right now and haven't since high school. If I lived for them, then I lived my time wasted because they have contributed nothing to my life since 1984 when I graduated. My, one of my best friends that went to Second Baptist over here when we split off and went to college, I went to Bible college. He went to a, a state school down there in Arkansas. And within six months, he was questioning the existence of God. And I realized we were not friends anymore and couldn't be. And I'll just tell you, young people, maybe some of you watching, you're homeschooled. That's great. But some of you are not. You're going to public school. That's fine. What I'm going to tell you is, at some point, you decide who's, who you're going to please. If you try to please the people at school, whether it's the school teachers, the school principals, the, or the student body, your friends, your classmates, you're going to have to decide Am I going to live for God or am I going to live my life for them? And I'm here to tell you they will not matter to you once you're not in school anymore. 
They will have no effect on your life. They will have no input on your life. They will not be there for you to talk to. They will not be there for you to cut up with. They, girls, they will not be there to go to the bathroom with. They will not be there for you to hear all your secrets. The only one that you'll have left for you is Jesus. And that's it. Can I hear God's people say amen? 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Absolutely spot on with the times that we're living in right now. You have to decide whose side you're going to be on. Verse 14, be not in, unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Now, in what context does that apply? All of them. All of them. In work, let's say in business, let's say you're going to start a business. Let me tell you, let me give you a little Bible wisdom. Do not start a business or go into business agreements with people that are lost. Why? Why? Because they're going to lie, cheat, and steal. And you're going to get sucked into it. They're not, listen, you're not, when you say to them, uh, we can't do that. That's illegal and dishonest. What do you think they're going to say? Oh, I'm sorry. Well, then we're just going to lose $35,000. You'd be better off losing $35,000 than you would to gain twice that dishonestly or illegally. It applies in societal areas. You'll go to college. They'll want you to join a fraternity. I would not hook up with a fraternity. I would not hook. I, I don't listen. You know what they'll promise you in a fraternity? They'll promise you that if you join in with them, that you'll always get the best jobs. You'll get looked at by the, 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 the top employers. You'll get the best business contracts. You'll have your way made in life. If you'll just hook in with their fraternity, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. You're joining in with a group of lost people who will try to use whatever influence they can on you to get you on their side. And I promise you, the devil will get you signed up in all kinds of places. Friend, one of my best friends in, in college, we still call every now and then talk to one another. He was, as a wrestler in high school, he was ranked fifth in the nation. He had colleges calling him. He had colleges and universities all over the country that would fly him to their university, put him up in a nice place, wine and dine him to get him to play wrestling for their school. And he was close to doing it, and God called him to preach, and he turned every one of them down and had to pay his own way through Bible college. He decided to let the world go and to follow Christ. And he right now is the head principal of the largest Christian school, Tulsa, Oklahoma, right now. I mean, it's huge. God has honored him that way. And young people, I, you, it starts in first grade, second grade, third grade. You decide that you're going to be a Christian. And whatever the world wants, you're going to turn it down. And you're just going to follow God. It's not easy. And you may not feel like just jumping up in front of everybody and saying, I'm a born again Bible believing Christian. You may want to be like Gideon and do it at night. But do it. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? When the, when the group that you're with wants to go out and drink. When they want to go out to a nudist bar. When they want to go watch something on TV. When they want to go watch a movie that ain't right. When they want to go be part of something that ain't right. You're going to have to decide, am I with them or am I against them? 
And I promise you, all you have to do is let them know one time that you don't do that stuff. You will never have to worry about getting invited to that again. Because they're going to go do it and they won't call you ever again. What fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion hath light with darkness? What concord hath Christ with Belial? What part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye, listen to this preacher now, ye are the temple of the living God. Would it be okay for us to install in the pews there little cup holders for people to bring their beer in? Oh, that wouldn't be right, would it? Would it be okay for us to provide little ashtrays for people to sit and... That be okay? Would it be okay to have a, have a church service where I could curse and use foul language in the sermon? Would that be okay? But this is not the house of God. You understand that? You are. You are. So if it's not okay, let's say that we were going to invite all the lost people to, and we were going to go knock on doors and say, what would it take to get you in our church? Well, let us drink our beer. Okay, we'll let you drink your beer. Well, let us smoke our cigarettes. Well, we smoke your cigarette. Uh, let us spit our tobacco juice out. Okay, you spit your tobacco juice out. Let us, let us sing songs that, that talk about whiskey drinking and, and slutting around and let us sing those kind of songs. Okay, we'll let you sing those kind of songs. Would that be okay to have in church? No. Well, you're the house of God. It wouldn't be okay to do with you anywhere. Because you are the dwelling place of God. See, there's this kind of preaching you used to hear a long time ago. You don't hear that kind of preaching anymore. But God was teaching Gideon a lesson about separation. And when Gideon finally decided to tear down daddy's idols, daddy's grove, kill his bull, and offer it to God, he was right then deciding that he wasn't going to live his daddy's life. Who in here had a mom or a daddy that was lost when you were growing up? Raise your hand. Okay. Who didn't know? <laughs> Who didn't know their daddy? Okay. Aren't you glad that they either got right or you're glad that you did not follow them? Maybe, and this is hard to think, but aren't you glad that you're not where they are now? Or where they're going. When it comes to. The cross. That Christ. And, this, and the sacrifice that Christ made for me. There is absolutely nothing in this world. That I want. More. Than forgiveness of my sins. And that's what it boils down to. So you have to decide. I'm not going to be what my daddy was. That's what Gideon was having to decide right then and there. And he not only separated from his dad. He destroyed his dad's religion as a sign. You see, in Sunday school, we talked about a guy in Oklahoma City. He's running a Satanist cult. And he hates God so bad he wears an upside down cross and he has rituals where they burn Bibles. Flip this over. God told Gideon to do exactly that with his daddy's religion. Not just reject daddy's religion, destroy daddy's religion. And Gideon did it. He did it at night, but he did it. And at some point, you have to let family know, I don't do that. I don't go there. You're going, to have a, you're going to have a family barbecue? What time is it? Saturday night? Okay, I can be there. 
Is there going to be drinking there? I'm sorry, I can't come. If you guys are going to pull out the Budweiser and the whiskey, listen, I know how Uncle Joe gets when he gets drunk, and I want no part of it. I don't know if you have an Uncle Joe or not, but everybody's got somebody in the family that cannot handle their liquor very well. And you just decide, you know, I love my family, but if that's what they're going to do every time they get together, I can't be part of it. That's their religion. That's their belief. That's their lifestyle. That's fine. I respect that. I don't have to be a part of it anymore. And I can't. When it comes to work, and what work wants you to do, and if they want you to do something that ain't right, oh, we got an election coming up. We want you to vote on all the liberals, all the people that are going to kill the babies and are going to put the sodomites everywhere in our schools. That's who we want you to vote for. I don't care if you're making $85 an hour, you say, I ain't voting for them. Ooh, did I just say that? It ain't right. They want you to do things at work. They want you to do things at school. They want you to do things down at the club that you go to, that you're part of. And you say, I can't do that. Because my Bible says I can't and I won't. So if you look at the rest of what God's saying, verse 16, What agreement at the temple of God with idols? You are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Verse 17 says what? Let's, in fact, let's read this out loud together. Wherefore, come out. I, I need to hear you. Come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Do you believe your Bible? There's an if in this sentence, is there not? If. You will come out from among them, and if you will not touch their unclean things, God will receive you. But what do you think the if is there for? If you do not come out from among them, and if you're touching their unclean things, don't call on me. I like Gloria has a saying, she may not want me to say it, but I love her, so I'm going to say it anyway. She always said concerning people that she knew, they always went to the bar all the time. She'd invite them to church, and they never would go to church. And when it come time to die, they always called the preacher. And she said, well, let them call the bartender to do their funeral. That's where they went. <laughs> She's not, not wrong. They never wanted to preach her. Never wanted anything like it, but they sure want somebody to preach them into heaven. My conscience won't let me do that. And when it comes to somebody that I don't know where they are, I just don't say much. But I sure don't preach them into heaven. Friends, I'm going to wind this down, but I'm going to say this is very simple. Figure out whose side you're going to be on because at some point, God's going to have everybody choosing sides. When Noah built the ark, it was up for grabs who could be in there. He's preached all that time, let's say 120 years, he preached wanting everybody to come in the ark with him, left the doors open, but seven days before the flood, God said, get in the ark. And Noah and his family got in the ark. They chose sides. And at some point, God will make it, not only He'll make it that simple, but He'll make it that important. You know, maybe it's not the biggest deal that you missed a Wednesday night service because you had to work, or because there was a meeting going on somewhere, or there was a school function or whatever. That may not be the biggest deal in the world. But it represents something that one of these days is going to be the biggest thing in the world. And you have to decide whose side you're going to be on. You're going to follow after your family, follow after the school, follow after work, 
follow after the social club that you're in, or follow, follow this, or follow that, follow what the government says, or you're going to do what God said. It's even divided families where a husband is saved and the wife is lost, or the wife is saved and the husband is lost. My mom made choices in her marriage. It did not hurt my dad. In fact, that's what led dad to calling upon the Lord. My mom did right. And I'm all the better for it. And you will be too. I want us to bow our heads. I'm not going to ask you a bunch of questions about what family's doing to you. I'm going to let that be between you and the Lord. But maybe God's dealing with you. Maybe you folks online, God's dealing with you. I mean, you guys that watch us online and you're there every service, I commend you for your faithfulness. And I know it's got to be hard because since you're not going to an actual physical church building, maybe it would be easier on you to just skip the service, go do something with somebody, and then say, well, we'll watch it later on, sir, on YouTube. Maybe that would be easier for you. But I'll tell you this, we've got people in the room right now that have traveled here to be part of the fellowship of people. They could have heard the sermon at any time. But they wanted to be here with the people of God. To meet the people of God. To fellowship with the people of God. And in some ways understand that they're accountable. Along with the people of God. And going to church makes that real in their life. Even if you're just attending online and watching us live, it makes you accountable. And it says, it sends a message. When it comes to church time, nothing else is more important than that. It sends a message. For those of you who are there all the time, I commend you. And to those of you who miss, I'm not trying to condemn you. I'm just trying to let you know there's a better choice. There really is. And I want you to make it. Make it now while it's easy. Because there's a day coming when you're going to have to make the choice. And it may be the hardest thing you've ever done. So this morning, I'm going to pray in a minute. But if God is dealing with your heart, even if it's something that has nothing to do with what I preached. I always like to leave that open so you don't feel guilty. But if God's dealing with you about something, you want to come down. I want to, I want to keep the benches open. If you want to come and pray, I'm going to give you a chance, but I'm going to pray for you nonetheless.